learned. Um, I am honored to be here myself, and I should say I'm quite flattered by the by the kind words that you say about um, the pinnacle of one's profession is uh, a challenge, and we'll take that as such. Um, but thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be in conversation with both Eric and Jason, whom um, I've met Eric more recently, Jason much longer, um, not too, too long, but of course, I've always been both. And I'm really interested in having a conversation, as I said, um, or starting off the conversation, really, um, with the visual arts. I know we have the Center for Jazz Studies, and I, I think I'll let Jason and Eric really handle more of that conversation. But I'm interested myself, not only um, in jazz in general, but I'm also interested in these moments where art history and avant-garde music practice sort of intersected. So I thought I'd just show really about five slides. Um, to talk a little bit about that history and maybe introduce some terms to um, start a conversation then with uh, Eric. I have to admit though, I might need a little bit of um, guidance. Somehow that ended up, sorry about that. Somehow that ended up being uh, very complicated. Yeah, it's okay. 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 Thank you. Um, so I want to start with a slide of uh, the artist and poet Tristan Zara who founded the uh, Cabaret Voltaire uh, space, performance space in Zurich. And I wanted to start with this image because uh, when the Cabaret Voltaire was founded, it was a moment where literally musicians, uh, theatrical performers, poets, and visual artists were really all coming together and beginning to influence each other's practice. Um, it was one of the most efficient moments where it's happening, and this is actually a, uh, a, a slide where Zara is performing uh, a poem in what he calls the Cubist outfit. So already the visual arts are deeply, deeply sort of integrated in his performance and ability. And I'm really interested in this moment because it is one of those, um, this sort of historical time where so many people in the creative capacity were interested in what it means to be on the art, and interested in what it means to bring what they call art into life. They had this sort of utopian sensibility wherein all of a sudden there would be no separation from creative tasks and one sort of everyday uh, practice. And so the, um, the kind of Dada's movement in uh, Zurich became one of the really essential moments of the 20th century where that happened. Um, and next I wanted to make a big historical leap uh, from Dada's understand is a really central figure for a lot of uh, musicians in New York, but especially a lot of, sort of musicians and visual artists as well who are interested in what avant-garde practice was, especially starting about the 50s. And I'm um, showing one work of Cage, a kind of score that he created for a piece of music. And I'm interested in how this composition became incredibly visual for Cage. Cage being most famous, of course, for uh, thinking about music outside of the capacity of the composition and order, but thinking about sound and tone and even the lack thereof as a kind of musical practice. And so, once again, it is moving music away from this kind of expertise and moving it into the sort of situation and the ambient situation around us in life. Um, Cage himself was very influenced by the Dadaists, and so um, I'm creating maybe a ball, but <laughs> um, I think the historical lineage that goes from Dada to Cage, and then onto Fluxus. And right now I'm showing a slide of uh, the Fluxus artist Ben Patterson, who's uh, performing a work called Solo for Violin, or One for Violin. It was originally written uh, by John um, Pike in 1961. This is, an, uh, this is an image from 1989, and this is Patterson's own interpretation of this work by John um, Pike. A lot of those artists actually were students of John Cage uh, in New York in the 50s, and went on to create the movement that we know as well as today, and also um, were very integral in the happening movement. So once again, you get this uh, this really interesting lineage of performativity, moving in, and performativity, uh, theater, performativity, and poetry, performativity for the music, um, moving into the visual arts. And plus it's also, I think, deeply significant for using music as its own sort of basis of trying to create a visual art practice. So oftentimes, the works that they created were called scores, and they were called compositions. So their language is coming directly from music. And with that, they were interested in this question of interpretation, or this moment of interpretation. That visual art itself could, um, need not be made by an expert artist or an expert musician, what have you. Um, they were to create a simple set of instructions 
that anyone could, be, uh, could perform and anyone could interpret. And so there's also a very um, deep commitment to a lack of expertise with Lovis. That doesn't mean it's crap, but there's a sense that, one, that we're moving uh, visual art out of the realm of the kind of uh, scholar academicians. Um, and then I'm sort of moving away from millennia to the avant-garde to think about some other spaces where jazz itself has been influential uh, for artists. Um, in the 80s, Cologne in Germany was a huge, huge site of uh, a kind of really uh, internal avant-garde practice, of a, a place where a lot of artists there at the moment didn't realize that they were creating these kind of self-contained practices that began to move out in the world, mainly to uh, other parts of Europe, uh, Western Europe, and then on to LA, in fact, uh, especially in the 80s. Um, and this is a group called the Golden Cock Quartet, uh, founded by Martin Kippenberger, who was really a central person in the Cologne art scene um, in the 80s. And I'm interested in the way that he chose jazz as the kind of basis of this music group at a time where everyone was really doing a lot of punk music, doing a lot of new wave music, no wave music, in fact. And, and um, the kind of music that really stands out, I think, for a lot of contemporary artists as the music they gravitate toward. At this time, this band was doing both rock, but also doing a lot of jazz work. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about Eric's hometown, uh, Vancouver, and also think about some other music practices that were happening at the time. Um, there was a huge sort of new wave scene also in Vancouver, uh, starting in the late 70s, 80s, coming out of the punk scene, moving into new wave, no wave, uh, with a lot of sort of artists that we know from uh, Vancouver, Ethan Wallace, Rodney Graham, Jeff Wall, and so forth. So I just wanted to posit these sort of ideas, this short history out there, um, as a way of maybe uh, introducing Eric's talk, and maybe these are some things that Eric can kind of speak to um, as he then goes through his own presentation. Thank you. We can switch up, I think. I'm just trying to I mean, I like seeing that poster. It's amazing. I've never seen that poster before. how I'm into that world. people like Mon Man, 
and his paintings, uh, one painting called Boogie Woogie. And then you pick up Stuart Davis's paintings, which I was very attracted to when I was a student, visually. And, um, and then when I became more involved and more knowledgeable, uh, of course, is the, the, the abstract expressionists. And uh, you know, the, the paid people like Franz Klein and William de Cooling and uh, going to the Cedar Tavern. I don't think it exists anymore, but uh, and it was also uh, where all these guys were. Uh, painters and the uh, poets and the visual arts would get together and drink and get into fights and all of that. But, but it was a pretty, pretty lively time. And uh, it was also the five spot. I just finished reading uh, Robert Kelly's amazing book on Monk, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's something I really wish I would say I've seen that. Some of that uh, fabulous book, by the way. I'm talking to George about it on the way over. Um, so those are just trying to bring those, those, those sort of sensibilities again. How how jazz has been very important to a lot of musicians um, and artists. I mean, I should say a lot of, a lot of visual artists that have stayed in Michael Snow and myself and other artists I know of my, of my generation in Canada. And I think also, obviously, ones I just mentioned. Um, I don't can't say that of the more recent musicians or artists and musicians coming up. I have a lot of reservations about that, and I won't say too much about it. Uh, just to give you a sense of my background, um, I don't know, again, I, I'm just trying to give you a sense of where I grew up in a, in a small town called Victoria, B.C. And uh, my mother's side of the family were American, so I spent a lot of my holidays down in Seattle, Washington, and I at the age of seven, about 15, I was shipped off down there. And, where I was exposed to another type of culture. I mean, Victoria was very lost, but uh, Seattle had a, a sea kind of tenderloin part of it, which I used to love walking down to the First Avenue, and uh, some of the music coming out of those bars was pretty wet. I don't remember that very well. And I was only about uh, seven or eight years old. Uh, I also, my aunt in Seattle was a, was a very gifted pianist to study with some, some very fine people, so I was exposed to classical music. And uh, very early on, and of course the Broadway tunes. And my mother loved. My mother actually saw Jimmy Lunsford in Vancouver in the early 40s, and she was accused of completely converted to jazz. She was always playing it all the time. So by the time the mid 50s came along, I was in high school, and uh, I uh, started checking out more. And uh, um, I was going to say some of the things were for me was that early, uh, early. Uh, Early inspiration came from uh, listening to records that had really fabulous cover art and good, good line notes. And uh, one of my first records I bought was had four saxophone tones called Twelve Tone Jazz with Frank Morgan and Lyle Murphy. <laughs> it was an amazing piece of, the, of course, Twelve Tone music. I didn't know how Twelve Tone music was, but of course I didn't know what it is now. And, uh, and of course, uh, my, one of my favorite records I used to draw it all the time was Bird at St. Nick's. Terrible recording. And of course, we were trying to lose our life. And I bought these all when I was in grade 10 or something. So this is going to be Victoria and Seattle, like that before. So this stuff really inspired me to draw. And I was always trying to find a visual equivalent. I played play the music and oh yeah, that's a drawing. So uh, out of that came patterns. So anyway, I'm just going to see, um, talk about, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah, that's sort of my background and why I'm here, I guess, and how I got into all this. So uh, I'm going to uh, walk through these slides now, excuse me, and uh, here we go. Uh, this is a drawing I did in the night, a series of drawings in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the in the 50s, late 50s, grade, late grade 11, so late grade 12. And I uh, was pretty becoming very interested in patterns and uh, I think rhythms and so forth. And this was fine. Uh, this is the only one that, that remains. I, I think I gave them away and put them on the wall. And, you know, the sort of things your kids do, you don't understand much about it. And um, I didn't go to university until the mid, mid 60s, so this was sort of like five years later. 
and I did something called the Three Musicians, which was kind of inspired by people like uh, Charlie Mickens and Eric Nolte, and, uh, and also the classic painting, the famous classic castle painting, all three, three musicians. And, uh, um, paths continue. This is Vancouver in 1971, and uh, this is about the setting, but it's quite different now. It's a developer city. And, uh, a lot of it's become a very expensive place to live now. And uh, anyway, this is, I bought a set of postcards and I basically started progressing. It's like a lot of this idea of the fluxes thing and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the idea of um, you know, intervening, doing interventions, finding something and intervening with it, going into it. The situation I was to do this too was another, another movement, a counter movement in the 60s. And, these would be the response to some situations, and, uh, and I can, of course, I don't know how he's waiting, not even yet, he knows what I'm talking about, but I don't know how much I want to go into all that, but uh, anyway, these are the sort of things that were influencing me at the time. Um, one of my professors we did, uh, and was, was studying with uh, some pretty interesting people in the Fluxus movement, and, uh, and so that sort of rubbed, rubbed up on me too. There's, there's the city turned into left response. And uh, the next one, the, the fantasy will be realized uh, a year later when I actually had the chance to paint the whole wall of the for Art Gallery with left response. Um, and uh, and this, next, this is the series I did called Never Realty. And, um, I was very interested in the idea of like uh, photographing uh, images and rather than painting them, other than painting, but I was really interested in photography and painting and combining the two. So um, I was also very interested in the idea of trying to play with illusion. You might notice the, tri the triangles, the first one is 12 inches, 12 inches um, long, the, next, the last one is 36 inches long. This is one of my colleagues, Pat Gray, who's following this. You set these up, I mean, to set these up to photograph, you have to do it like a surveyor, the screens and all that, and, and set, set it up in such a way so it would fit the format of the camera. So this is how they look when they're set up. So they, in fact, they, they levitate, if you will. In fact, I think they're all the same size, too, so it's kind of an illusion. <laughs> Anyway, this was sticking out the uh, Leopard Realty, sticking out the um, real estate. Around the same time, I was working on this piece. This is a, uh, a laminated uh, red and yellow cedar saxophone that I carved. I did four of these saxophones, uh, leopard spots. Uh, I created this alter ego character called Dr. Drew. And Dr. Boot needed a totem. I'd been eating clubbing by Scrubs in the late 60s and early 70s before I was university. And I was really interested in the idea of that as the idea of totem photos. And we have a lot of them up in Vancouver, probably a lot down the coast, in fact. Uh, and I mean, you can see her because it's an amazing material to work with. This is when you could buy cedar, now it's really expensive. Uh, there's 20 coats, right hand rock coats of lacquer uh, on this, this particular model. And a lot of work was all done with great care. And I inserted a kazoo mouthpiece into it. So it's sort of an inserted in the whole thing. And uh, uh, around the same time, uh, we were doing a performance in Los Angeles. We did a parody of the uh, Academy Awards and General Idea and uh, uh, the data group in San Francisco, our group, the Image Bank in Vancouver, was on the Western Front. We all went down to Burge to fill the Elks, Elks Lodge across from MacArthur Park uh, with a thousand people, and we did this whole thing on the, uh, the uh, Academy Awards. And I got the Best Camouflage Award. If you get in on that, obviously. But, um, uh, the case was built by uh, uh, one of my longest old friends, 
Clapping is Rick Ross. And uh, it's like a, and I, this is where the part I want to come in and talk about collaboration now, because a lot of my work is of a collaborative nature, although I do carve these out of my hand. I'm not much of a craftsman, but I had to pay my dues somewhere. Uh, the next piece is a, is a track stop as Mr. Peanut. And uh, we, uh, we, we did this song and dance act uh, on George Street. I tooted away on the kazoo, pennies from heaven. And uh, <laughs> not very well. Talking about, this, talking about visual artists getting, trying to do music, I sometimes wonder about it. Michael Stones will be one I really know does it really well. Um, anyway, we had a fun doing this. I helped, helped Vincent build that, uh, that uh, costume. Oops, go back to here. Yeah. Does it come up? Does it come up? George, does the music on it? Sure.
speaking of collaboration, I worked I hired a person to make these for me. And I also collaborated with Frank for all the drawings for these studies. And I'd like to thank Julian for making these beautiful things and we painted them. Uh, this is another installation of the Charles H. Scott Gallery. Uh, George actually came to this show, came to the opening in 2002 uh, in, in Vancouver, and I uh, did a huge wall of drawing, which I'm not showing in this particular piece because it, uh, it, did, it, did, it, didn't, it didn't have time to draw in. That's another detail. There are all the, all the studies on the far wall there of the, these various shapes on the catalog of. Uh, vessels that uh, the Greeks uh, uh, chose to drink out of. The word symposium, of course, comes from sit. Symposium comes from the drinking parties they have. And also these, these vessels were used for wines and mixing waters and so forth. The one, for instance, on the right was used for cooling. On the with the wire, there was, there was a steel girders supporting it. It was used for cool water and that you put it in the water. That's a slight point of shape that way. Now we move into something else here. This is uh, uh, a project I did uh, with, uh, with uh, three people. Rick Ross, probably fabricate the set. The nasty, late Nancy Shaw, got her name. she was actually a PhD you know, she, from McGill, wrote uh, a text and a voiceover and uh, Paul Plinley, who is a, a Vancouver musician, a piano player, um, helped do the music for this. And uh, it was a homage to the uh, film War of uh, the same name, film War. I have a great film War and addiction as much as I do for jazz. And uh, I saw the film when I was a kid, so it always had a strong impact on me. I saw it with my mother and my aunt, actually. And also, it was a vehicle for a lot of the great jazz musicians. Comes to my home office, of course, and a lot of musicians play this tune for him, and um, he seemed to be have a lot of interesting things. One of the other things I was interested in, of course, was the uh, uh, the idea of um, looking through windows. Fritz Lang has some really interesting films in that period, from about 1930 to 1944. Um, looking in a window, for instance, a very good example. Of of course, that, bring, that brings up the name of Khan because you were teaching something you desire and you want that, and that kind of thing. So it's it all that kind of art speak, which I was not unlikely to get that when I had a sense of it. And uh, anyway, yeah, this was also set in uh, an old part of Vancouver, which was in fact the old Red Light District. So he threw the windows and, and all this, you know, on this movie set. There's a detail of the movie set here. Uh, and the, in the, the story of Laura, which, which was written by Vera Casper in 1942, was the first kind of a novel to come out in that format and the film and it was adapted to film. Uh, you have to think she was you know, the, the likes of Raymond Chandler and, and, uh, and writers like that for a woman to come out and write a novel like that. It's a beautifully written book and, uh, and, and to adapt it to film. It's, 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 uh, and of course, it has there's some, there's some popular changes done to it, of course, naturally. But uh, for instance, the, the clock itself has a, a wooden shotgun in it. You can see the wood there. Um, this, uh, I placed it in a stretched in stretch, in stretch way in front, the head of the way in front and back and forth. I didn't like it to put a real shotgun in it because it seemed too little. And, um, and the real story of that is two, there's two groups, there's two long clocks, or two grab. And for the plots for the real story, and uh, you don't really see that, but this is, you know, making my own interpretation of it. And the man piece, of course, is all about the, the, the room, uh, the male, and all that. But the green, the choice of the color is very important, and of course, the two vessels. And rather than trying to do a painting, I don't know, took a 19th century uh, uh, portrait of a woman, Jennifer, and uh, used that to sell that. And of course, the classically laid motif in all the Mars is the Venetian wine. And there's a detail. <coughs> so these were basically like this, like a like movie set, but it was also the sound the soundtrack, which is coming up in a minute, by the way. There's another detail there. And 
George, with the next one coming up here, why don't we get that sound working? Okay, here we go. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Laura, that yours is a story to be under the auspices of war leads me to situate your time in my own, the undead moon. There are so many parallels between our times that they, for now, are too numerous to recount. While your author, Vera Caspery, investigates the bounds of feminine and masculine, your director, Otto Peminger, focuses on the crisis of masculinity, whereby those who don't fight in the war are considered to be less than manly. As I listen to your theme song and contemplate your portrait, I am reminded of the depicted reputation of creative type. Rick 
cross and I'm helping build that. He built it. And I developed the photography. There was no there was no one response. There was nothing that he was very, very minimal this piece. And uh, so uh, it was also the videotapes and it was a media piece basically. So uh, it was quite a for nineteen seventy six, seventy seven it was kind of an interesting piece to do in a way. But uh, I like to paint. And this is sort of a this is called sextet is being here. And uh, I did 48 of these other paintings. Um, I'd like to just comment quickly about that. This is all ties in with my project with George, which would come in around the same time. I actually read really George's book. It came out here in 2008. We confirmed that we were working together. I was so inspired when I did 16 of these little paintings <laughs> reading his book. So this was uh, one of the little paintings I did. Uh, this was a piece called the Setup. It was a small gallery in Vancouver, and it was uh, collaborating with the young, one of my former students, actually, Vanessa Kwan. And uh, I, uh, she did the wall pieces, and I did the sort of architectural details, and they had some fun with the heating, the vent over there, the gallery. But I also saw it this way, too. You can see the abstract, you can walk around the gallery and see the sort of details like that. So I was really interested in the abstract, man. Another collaboration with Paul Matthew, uh, one of Canada's foremost ceramists, and uh, we did this piece, did six of these, uh, a couple summers ago in his studio. And, we, and I would do one, one painting, and he would come back, and we was basically just creating floors, creating tools, whatever you want to call it, as you do in jazz. Another sampling of the, uh, of the uh, studies for the, the uh, icons piece I did with George Lewis. And uh, these are all they have names, jazz names, a lot of them do. I think on the, on the actually on your the um, poster that you'll feel out there yeah, for me, and it's, it's called the Brown Well, that was a, that was a lead market team, so you probably know that. Uh, more detailed shots from the installation. This is a gallery that now has become quite more formalized now. On the, in Vancouver, downtown Vancouver. It's called 560 now. It was called 560 Seymour Street. And, uh, and uh, it's being moved into a nightclub. And we're now in gallery too. So we came into this place with a really rough. And I mean, I didn't know I didn't. It was amazing. But anyway, George came up to, came up to in the fall when we had our first meeting. And then came out again in January to install this with Damon. Uh, and, uh, on, uh, and, uh, as there is more details of this. I might add that, uh, that in designing these pieces, go back to the back here a bit, we had to come across a design that would work and house George's sound and also sensors. So I came up with the idea of uh, these, these triangular forms and uh, we, I, we started playing around these ideas back in 2008 when I came out to, to New York and in May, uh, we had several meetings then and went on for all this and we came up with this idea and came, we had to come up with some new work. So, uh, these are details from the, from these, uh, okay, abstract, some abstract versions of the ways of looking at them. How did the sense of work? I'll tell you in a minute. I'll just quick, I'll just tell you. George, maybe you can probably remember that too. But uh, these should be said. These, these are more studies for for this. Um, for the, these are studies for the pain. Well, uh, here's this one. We'll explain it here a bit. The base at the base of the base of these things. Uh, the three sides. Um, speaker. When you said George bought seven of these speakers, he bought them up in California, I believe, and then had each sensor. Put a little guy, some guys inside the bottom here on each one. There's, there was like, there's tw there were seven of them, like there were 21 sensors. So if you walk around, and we have a sample here coming up in a minute, so on the last slide, um, how it works. You walk around, you get a different sound. And George pre recorded this with this, uh, with a group called Stan and Wayne in Vancouver. And, um, uh, yeah. 
So you'd walk in and you had the V-stick to go off and create these different sort of sound and visual effects. I also have to take into consideration um, the, the nature of where we, where we live on the West Coast. Uh, you know, the trees and the mountains and the beasts and the wild animals and the total poles and all that. So I'm very sensitive of how I went through this without appropriation of uh, the total poles and all that. So I tried to talk that out very carefully. So I tried to, it's like combining, it was, became a design thing in a way because you had to, had to accommodate the, 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 uh, the speakers, the sensors, and also to think about the visual aspect of it. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to create a forest, basically, with mountains in it. So this is uh, another detail there. And uh, uh, and there's another detail there of the, how we walk into the forest. And so the wall paintings are kind of important to make create this sort of, uh, you walk into this, in the front and you walk in and come back and it's, it's all jungle like So that's a, a thing. With the, with the, with the for instance, the, the post, uh, uh, I came like with color and uh, walking around, we seem to create uh, and primary colors. I chose the black piece primary colors because they work better. It was a nice off shoot to the greens and, and the oranges. And when they work well, come, come along, come along. I had a lot of fun with, with all this, actually, with working with, with this. And it was already a, and these are all hand drawn in, by the way. But, I mean, I spent weeks drawing these things. And I had a whole crew of uh, really yeah, wonderful young artists who are all talented in their own right. With, uh, and, but I hired them out to help me work on this. So uh, that's how uh, it worked. There's another detail here. So I think the next piece is a, is a live section coming up, and this will include this this uh, show. And uh, George very kindly tonight um, helped me put this together. Thanks, George.